So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Bragg. I'm the uh, Frank and Julie Jungers Dean of the College of Engineering. Thank you all for joining us. It's a great uh, uh, crowd this evening for this first lecture in the 2018 uh, Engineering Lecture Series. This series is presented in a partnership with the College of Engineering and the UW Alumni Association. If you're not a member, I encourage you to visit the Alumni Association website at uwalum.com and learn more about membership. So increasingly our homes are becoming more automated. Uh, you can tell your smart speaker or device to order something from one of the online retailers. You can play music. You can find the weather report, how long it's gonna to take to drive to the airport, many different things pretty easily. But for people with physical limitations, home robots have the potential to improve the quality of life and independence. Uh, if you're my age, you remember the Jetsons, right? And, and Rosie the robot, right, which I enjoyed. Uh, tonight, one of the foremost roboticists who's working to turn robot Butler into reality is with us. Sid Srinivasa joined the UW from Carnegie Mellon in 2017. At UW, he holds, holds the Boeing Endowed Professorship at the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. He runs the Personal Robotics Lab, which he started in 2005. This is a new term for me. He's a full stack roboticist, which means he designs algorithms and builds end-to-end -end systems that integrate machine learning, perception, planning, and control in the real world. I guess that's kind of the whole robot. He's worked with Intel, DARPA, Google, NASA, and other agencies. He's been featured on the BBC and the National Geographic. And his robot Herb was seen in the movies and television, opening Oreos, I missed that, and serving sushi on the X-Files. So it's my privilege to introduce Sid for his lecture. Sid. Hello, everyone. Uh, Thank you so much for having me here. It's such a pleasure to be here speaking to such a distinguished audience. And thank you, Michael. Um, I came here one year ago after 18 years at uh, Carnegie Mellon University building robots. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful for all the support that I've had to make this transition happen. Um, it's been uh, more than what I could have imagined uh, about making this move, about meeting the people here who've been so kind and, and, and generous about welcoming us, my family, uh, and my robot. Uh, so, so thank you so much. Uh, it's because of you uh, that we're here, and it's because of you that we're able to do the things that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I also want to acknowledge my group. Uh, this was the first picture that we took after we moved to the University of Washington. Uh, it's a, a Right before I, dis I made my decision to move to, uh, to Seattle, I told my team that I was moving. And I said, if you guys want to come, that would be great. Uh, and every single one of them decided to move. Um, <laughs> it was a great pleasure. Maybe it's Pittsburgh, Seattle, but, uh, <laughs> but I love Pittsburgh. Um, but um, I, think, uh, I think it's a testament to the way um, UW and Seattle have received us uh, that we're here. Uh, I also brought my robot. So this is Herb, like Michael was saying. Um, Herb, uh, to, you know, I, I have, to my grudging acknowledgement, is, uh, is very famous. And it's a robot that, um, he's a robot, uh, that I've been building since 2005. Uh, I started building Herb um, when I was at Carnegie Mellon University, and I've continued to build him since. Started off as a single arm, then I got some money, and I put a base, and then I put the arm on the base, so it's a little bit scrappy about how you, you build your little Millennium Falcon out of like various components, and you're the only one who can run it. That's literally why Carnegie Mellon decided to let me have Herb. Uh, it's kind of an archaic relic, but um, really, I think, like Michael was saying, um, we all grew up watching science fiction. I, I grew up reading science fiction. I read a lot of Ray Bradbury, and I always wanted to, to build robots that could actually help people, that could actually go out and do things in the world, to get robots out of the factory floors and into people's homes. Um, and today, I'll show you a few vignettes of uh, some of our efforts at trying to get robots uh, to work with and around people, uh, which is incredibly challenging for us. Specifically, I work on manipulation. Robotic manipulation. Uh, I get robots to pick stuff up 
and put them back down. Uh, turns out this is incredibly hard for robots. It's still an ongoing problem. I don't know why. Um, I, I'm reminded the first time I started working on robots, this was back in 99, I went back home to India and I told my grandmother very excitedly, I'm trying to get robots to pick things up. And so she sort of looked at me and said, you know, the coffee mug, it's just right there. Why don't you just tell the robot to just pick it up? It's just right in front of you, just pick it up. And I said, no, no, grandma, configuration spaces, it's mathematics, it's complex, it's non-Euclidean. But she's like, no, it's just, it's just right there. You know, it's a coffee mug, you pick it up. Uh, and to be very honest, I still don't know the answer to my grandmom's question. Um, uh, I, it's, uh, it's magical how effortless we manipulate objects as humans, and it's magical how challenging it is to take that intuition and put that into a robot and turn it into algorithms and theorems such that the robot can do it itself. And that's been sort of the eternal quest of robotics and manipulation is to take human intuition, some things that we do so effortlessly and so easily, and put them into a, a device, a machine, such that it can think for itself. So in many ways, whenever I build robots, I feel like I'm learning something about myself, about humans, about humanity, um, that I'm able to transfer to mathematics and transfer to a robot. So let me give you a, a video uh, of what our robot does. So this is a commercial that we shot for Oreo, like Michael was referencing. Uh, this is Herb in action. And uh, the history of this commercial is that two weeks before they shot this commercial, Oreo called me and said, we want you to separate the cookie from the cream. Apparently, this is a big deal for humans. Uh, and I said, OK, we'll do this completely autonomously. So we build perception algorithms, control algorithms, that can actually pull the Oreo apart with the robot's fingernails uh, and, uh, and actually make this happen. Um, and and the, the, the several funny things here. First of all, uh, when we started this, doing this, uh, uh, two weeks. You know, we had we only had two weeks, and when we started this, uh, it's going to show again. Laugh again, uh, but uh, we had no idea whether we would succeed. Um, you know, we had built this robot. It was clearly not built to separate Oreos. I could build you a way better machine to separate Oreos. But I think it's a testament to the building blocks of autonomy that we built, of perception, planning, control, learning, that we were able to get this robot to figure out how to do a task that is so human um, in, and, and succeed in just a couple of weeks. Um, and so I think it also turned out that this is such a blessing in disguise because the Oreo is one of the most delicate and sensitive objects that my robot has ever manipulated. And, uh, and it was great. And, and, and the failures were delicious. Uh, and so it was, a, it, was a, it was a huge pleasure doing this. Uh, and I think this lies at the heart of robotics, right? Like you look at Herb and you think, yeah, he's doing something that um, is weirdly different from what a robot is capable of doing. You know, he's not at a factory floor building cars for us. And robots do amazing things. When, when they're in environments that are structured for robots. But if you look at my home, uh, it looks nothing like a factory floor as much as we would like it to be. There's clutter, there's uncertainty. And what we're trying to do is to get robots out of the factory floors and into people's homes doing the kinds of things that, that we sort of take for granted all the time. I also say, say truth in advertising, this only works about two out of 10 times. Um, so uh, the Oreo problem is still wide open if anyone's interested in funding me on this. I've tried many times. Uh, but uh, I did a sort of informal user study with my son. And he succeeds about five out of 10 times. So we're you know, close to human six-year-old skills. Um, so today, I'm going to tell you uh, a story. I'm going to give you some of the algorithms that go into building a robot like Herb. By the end of this talk, hopefully you'll have an understanding of what it takes to build a robot that can separate the cookie from the cream two out of 10 times. Um, and, I, and I'm also excited to tell you about some of our new initiatives of trying to build robots that can actually help people. So sort of going back in time, um, this is actually an incredibly evocative picture uh, for all of us who have worked in computer science and science. This is a picture of uh, Deep Blue uh, beating Gary Kasparov um, in, in chess. Uh, so this happened in the 80s. Uh, so it's very inspiring because uh, here was a robot 
uh, that beat a human, ostensibly the smartest human to play that game, in a game that was designed for humans, by humans. Um, and this is a, a great feat of AI. Um, I was a little kid, uh, I had just started programming, and I decided that, yes, I'm gonna build my own chess playing robot and, and, and do everything. Um, and I think it was, it was also particularly inspiring for me now when I look back at it because, and maybe this is just because I work on this field, here's this robot that's beating the best chess player in the world at something that was designed by, uh, in a game that was designed by humans, but yet it needs a human to move its chess pieces. And so, so maybe, just maybe, the hardest part about playing chess uh, is not thinking tens or 20 or 50 moves ahead, but actually picking up those delicate pieces and moving them around, right? Um, of course, that's exactly what I work on, but um, I think it, it, it forces us to think about what's hard for robots and what's not hard for robots and how to bring about a reconciliation between the two. And that's really been a focus of my research, which is to bring about this reconciliation between what robots are really good at to sort of geometric search in very, very clean, clean worlds. They play chess better than we do. They play Go better than we do. They build cars better than we do. Well, what we need to do is to resolve how they can address the nitty gritty of the physical world that we live in, right? Our world doesn't look like a beautiful, clean chessboard where the pieces are exactly where you want them to be. The rules are perfectly laid out. Our world is filled with clutter and uncertainty, and that's been a quest of mine, is to try to reconcile this world that robots are really used to and familiar with with what they ought to be used to so that they can actually solve real problems for us in the real world. So when I think of manipulation, uh, and I think of the applications that I care about, getting robots to work with us and around us. Manipulation is really not just about a robot acting in isolation, but really robots working with and around us. Uh, if I look around here, this human environments are filled with humans. And there's several ways in which a robot can deal with humans. It can treat humans as obstacles that must be avoided. Um, you know, little pieces of furniture that happen to move around. Uh, but that's, that's deeply unsatisfying to me, right? What I would like is for humans and robots to actually work together um, and, and treat each other as equals. And, and this is actually a, a very evocative example for me. This is Jacques Pepin, uh, my favorite TV chef. And every once in a while, he gets his daughter, Claudine, um, onto his TV show. And she really isn't a cook, and she, it's fairly unscripted. But yet, they seem to have so much fun together like preparing a meal together, right, with each other, you know, with the banter and, the, and, and, and what they are able to perform together. And that's what I would like my robot to be able to do. You know, when, when I have my little Rosie the robot in my home and it enters the kitchen, I don't want to flee the kitchen, like, you know, horrified by, you know, the, the, the crazy ninja moves that it's going to do. I want to be able to work with and around this robot such that we can prepare a meal together, you know, like Jacques Pepin and Claudine. And that is an understanding of the delicate dance that is human-robot collaboration. When two humans work together, there's a lot of prediction, control, action that happens there that's far more than treating each other as obstacles that must be avoided. It's about understanding each other and about working with each other as equals. And that's actually been a second quest of mine, is to bring about another reconciliation between what robots, again, are really good at, optimal control, Bayesian reasoning, and how to reconcile that with actually working with and around people, cognitive psychology, human psychology, child psychology, where we're trying to find qualitative ways in which we can describe humans and describe how humans interact with other humans. Now, how do we take those ideas of how children grow up, how children learn, how people learn, and turn them into a mathematical language that can then be put into a robot such that the robot can act and behave just like we do with each other. Right? And, and I'll talk a little bit about that too. And here's actually a video of this in action. Uh, this is actually a little user study we did where the robot was trying to deliberately, using its mathematical principles, deceive that little girl. Um, and the robot has no idea of the qualitative aspect of deception. 
But what it was trying to do was to model the inferences that the girl would make of what, where the robot was going and to deliberately change that model using Bayesian reasoning and optimal control to think that it was going after a particular object while it was actually going after the other object. So what was really interesting here is that when we wrote out the mathematics of deception, human interpretable behavior emerged out of this mathematics. Right? And when you look at this robot, you think, oh, it's just fooling around with this girl. It's trying to deceive her. But that was not what we wrote into the mathematics. Right? And I think that's the power of mathematical reasoning is that human interpretable behavior, things that we look at and say, oh, that's deception. Oh, it's trying to help her. Like, all comes out of, or oh, it's trying to deceive her. Everything falls out of the mathematics of human-robot collaboration. And today I'll talk a little bit about how we build this foundation of the mathematics of human-robot collaboration. So I'll start with manipulation, um, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move into how we can do manipulation with and around people. The, the flavor of manipulation that I really love, um, it's just my, my own peculiar love, uh, is physics-based manipulation. I, I want robots to be able to push, pull, slide, topple objects, to use physics and gravity as a helping hand, and not have to rigidly you know, have a death grip on every object that they're manipulating. If you look at a robot on a factory floor, it performs magical feats, but it never sort of pushes or pulls or slides or like, you know, tosses the car chassis to the next robot. Because then you're beholden to physics, you're beholden to the world around you, and you actually need to reason about physics to be able to solve these problems. But you think about the way you make breakfast in the morning, right? Pretty much every action you take is a non-prehensile manipulation action. Non-prehensile means you're not holding on to an object with your, with your thumb and the rest of your fingers. Right? You're twirling spaghetti, you're moving objects around, you're, you're dragging your, your milk close to yourself. And all of those rely on physics, rely on gravity as a helping hand. A factory floor will work on the surface of the earth, on the moon, on an elevator. But the way you manipulate your, your coffee mug as you drag it towards yourself really relies on the existence of gravity, really relies on the understanding that the world behaves in a particular way that's predictable, but yet useful to, to be able to exploit gravity and other things that are available to you. And so this is how it all started, actually. Um, this is actually a, a project that we did for DARPA, where we realized, the robot realized that there was a, uh, a rock, it's a fake rock, that was far away from its hands, and so it was able to drag it close to itself to pick it up. A thing that we do all the time, right? We, something's far away from us, we pull it close to ourselves and we pick it up. We actually hand programmed this, we hand coded this. This was not automated, the robot didn't figure it out. But we realized that if the robot is far away, then it, the rob that it could, if the object is far away, then the robot could just drag the object close to itself. It's just common sense encoded into a static rule. But this sort of asked a question that I really wanted to answer, which is, how can the robot figure this out by itself, right? Um, that's what we want. We want. We don't want to be able to. We don't want to have to hard code every single rule into the robot. We want the robot to be able to figure this out all by itself. And that really started my quest of trying to be able to harness the mechanics of manipulation to be able to funnel uncertainty, to be able to solve problems. Right? How do we use physics and gravity in a way that helps us, rather than in a way that we have to completely avoid and treat as as obstacles? And, and, uh, and this is actually an example of where the robot is actually just pushing an object such that it funnels the uncertainty into its hands. Something that we do all the time when we reach into a cabinet to actually pick something up. We're funneling uncertainty using our tactile sensing and, and all of our sensing to be able to solve problems. So to be able to do this, you need two things. Um, one is you need a model of interaction. Before, when you were just rigidly grasping objects, you didn't care about how the objects moved at all. Now, when you push an object, you need to know how it's going to move. Right? And so we actually use um, this quasi-static pushing model from physics as an approximation. Uh, quasi-static pushing is an approximate model of how the world behaves. It basically says that the object stops moving as soon as you stop pushing it. 
So you push an object, as soon as you stop pushing it, it stops moving. This is true for a lot of objects. You should experiment with objects around you. But this is also not true for several objects, like a ball. Right? It keeps moving as soon as you stop pushing it. So uh, it's an approximate model, and it works reasonably well. And so it's a little bit like what I'd like to do when I'm rummaging through my kitchen re you know, refrigerator to pull something out. I want to know approximately, if I push the casserole, where is it going to go? I don't need to know the exact x, y, z location of where the casserole ends up. What I care about is, is it going to fall out, or is it going to stay inside? One of the big advantages of the quasi-static pushing model is that we can run thousands of rollouts very, very fast. What does that mean? That means that the robot can hallucinate hundreds of thousands of futures. What happens if I push it this way? What happens if I push it that way? In the order of milliseconds. Right? So the robot is, in effect, playing chess with the physical world now, where, it's a, where the moves are governed by the laws of physics. And now we've taken this really, really hard abstract problem of how do I extract my casserole from my refrigerator and turned it into this problem of search, of physics, of how do I sequence a set of quasi-static pushing moves such that I'm able to extract the object from there. And now it's just playing chess. Right? It's able to do that. Uh, and, and this is what comes out of it, right? So what we're able to do here is the robot just knows that these objects exist and is able to use its entire arm, its whole body, to push, pull, and slide these objects around such that it can grab it. And, and it's able to cradle the object in its, uh, you know, in its elbow as it pushes it forward. And the funny thing is that we never told it any of these motions, right? All it did was it saw the world, as a giant game of chess that it needed to play, and it decided, I'm going to solve this problem. And it was able to solve it in the order of seconds. Right? I was actually able to come up with solutions that I had no idea about. Like, it's fascinating watching a robot. You know, just put a bunch of objects in front of a robot, and you watch it, and it does all kinds of things. And some of them are suboptimal, potentially, but that's just how it wants to interact with the world. So this actually is a, started a whole new paradigm called whole arm manipulation. It sounds really obvious, right? You should use your entire arm to move objects. That's what we do all the time. If you're carrying a bunch of books and you reach a door, you just use your entire body to open the door. But this is shockingly new, surprisingly, for robots, because robots always interact with objects with their end effector, their hand. You know? and, and that's all they do. And what we did was to sort of change the paradigm and say, when you stop looking at the end effector as something that needs to rigidly grab objects and just use the entire arm, you can actually do a lot more than you could with just the hand. Like you can move things that you cannot move at all. So how does this work? I'll, I'll give you the, the very, very high level overview of it. The robot searches through the possible world of solutions to be able to go from its start configuration to its goal configuration. And we use what are called rapidly exploring random trees. The robot is doing randomized searches as fast as it can, all of them in parallel. And here what it's doing is that it's grown a search tree where every configuration, every dot in that search tree is a configuration of the world that it has hallucinated. This is all the robot's hallucinations. It's doing tens of thousands of these every second. It, think of it as like a game tree in chess where it's where it's predicting what the opponent will do, and it's trying to, to make the right move. And every edge here is a move that it can make. And because we're doing quasi-statically, we can actually do this incredibly quickly. What the robot does is that when it knows that it needs to reach a particular point, a particular target, it uses what's called a, a shooting method, where it finds the nearest point on the tree, and then just shoots out. That's where it needs to go. And it shoots out a whole bunch of potential solutions. So, Think of your robot as a tree that's growing. It wants to reach a particular point. It just shoots out a bunch of branches. And then it finds the branch that gets the closest and then just keeps growing there. And it does this until it actually reaches its goal. And then it, just like in, in chess or in search, it does a backtrack to actually find out the path from the start to the goal. So we've taken this really, really hard problem of how do we get the casserole out of the fridge and turned it into a problem of search, which the robot is actually able to do very, very effectively. So how do we address uncertainty? So think of it as you know, your vision system or your perception system gives you a reported pose. 
The problem with any system, visual, visual system, including our own eyes, is that we don't exactly know where the object is. We sort of think it's there, but there's this sort of fog of uncertainty around the object where we don't quite know where it's at. And what the robot is doing is that it's trying to place the smallest possible net such that it can capture that uncertainty. And again, it's treating it as a search problem. Smallest possible net, because if it throws a really, really large net, then it might actually capture other objects that it shouldn't be capturing. You don't want to extract you know, the, the Coke and the, 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 the rice out of your refrigerator instead of just the casserole. And so what the robot does is it, it places the correct net such that it can capture the uncertainty region. And it's able to do that very, very effectively. Here's actually a really cool example of this. This is um, uh, the infamous DARPA lug nut. DARPA gave us millions of dollars to get a robot to replace a tire uh, in a car. And it turned out the hardest problem was picking up the lug nut. Uh, and, and, and so uh, the, the interesting thing here is that several teams, there were five, of five teams that were trying to do this, solve this problem. And none of us could pick up the lug nut. We just couldn't. We, we hand-coded as many strategies as we could. It was too small. There was just too much uncertainty. It was too shiny. It would keep slipping. And we told our algorithm to try and solve this problem. You know, this is one of the rare cases where I wasn't able to come up with a, with a better solution than my algorithm. And what the algorithm does is actually incredibly interesting, right? It uses two of its fingers and turns them into a little funnel. And it uses that funnel to shovel the lug nut into the middle of its fingers and then picks it up. So it's using its fingers, it's shaping its fingers into a funnel so that it can reduce uncertainty. And what's really interesting is, just like the Oreo demo, all of this is completely emergent, right? We didn't tell the robot to form a, a funnel with its fingers. It was just able to search through the space of pre-shapes that's possible, the space of motions that it can do, to actually come up with a strategy that was better than a human strategy, right? So that was really interesting. So one other testament to this is um, our algorithm runs on the Mars rover. Uh, so this is uh, the NASA K-10 uh, Mars rover. And uh, NASA came to me and said they wanted to get this robot to move terrain, to reconfigure terrain. And it only had one small problem. It had no arms. Uh, there's no arms on this robot, but they wanted to move stuff around. And we said, sure, we'll just try our algorithm. Why not use the entire body of the Mars rover to actually move terrain around. And so we took this, our, our algorithm that we had designed for robot arms, and we just applied it on the Mars rover, and this is what the robot did. So this is the, the Mars rover in action. It's using its, its wheels, it's using its body to, to cradle the objects and move them around. And as, as you look at it as humans, you always tend to anthropomorphize it. You're like, oh, it's creating a little hand out of its sort of two front, uh, front tires, but all of this is completely emergent from just the mechanics of manipulation. Just write out the mathematical equations and you see what the robot ends up doing, which is, which is really exciting. So this is great for us because we were able to show a robot working in a situation where we'd never designed. It was just like the Oreo demo where I never thought that our algorithm would work on the Mars rover, but it turned out that it did, which is amazing. And uh, I think really a testament to the generality of the algorithms. So I want to talk a little bit about manipulating with and around people. Uh, until now, I've talked almost exclusively about robots manipulating in isolation. The Oreo demo just had the Oreo. Uh, we had just the lug nut and then just the, the lonely Mars rover. But I'm really excited about robots that can not just work by themselves, but actually work with and around people. Um, and uh, about six years ago, I started a collaboration with a company called Kinova, to build robots that can actually help people. So these are robot arms that are mounted on powered wheelchairs. And we're helping people with uh, upper extremity disabilities, uh, high spinal cord injury, MS, ALS, to be able to perform uh, everyday tasks like opening uh, drawers and, and picking up objects. And what we're doing here is to use the same algorithms that we developed on Herb, for, for separating the Oreo, for, for moving the Mars rover, to actually work with and around people in shared autonomy. Right? So this is actual deployments of our work in, with real people in the real world. 
And, and, and there's one, one point that I want to make here was the, the first time I went and spoke with these users, um, you know, as a, as a technologist, I, I told this girl, um, I'm going to solve all of your problems. I'm going to automate everything for you. You know, I'm just going to build a robot that just automates everything. And, and she actually had an incredibly important and evocative point to make. She said, this robot is one of the few things in my life that I can control, and you're taking that control away from me. You're just making it yet another thing that's telling me what to do. And I don't want that. Uh, and I think that, that's a lesson that I learned that I have never forgotten. Right? I think that we have to always think about who the users of our technology are such so that we can build robots for them. And that actually started a huge... <laughs> yeah, that's actually that's Seb, one of the users that we work with. Um, yeah, he uses a foot-mounted joystick. Uh, he's pretty remarkable. Um, but uh, so I, I think that little girl's comment really started me along a new path. Um, you know, until this time, I had just been thinking about autonomy. I wanted to build robots that could do stuff all by themselves. And then I started thinking about shared autonomy. How do we build robots that are not just f interacting all by themselves, but working with and around people? I want to build robots that can act like a caregiver acts with a person. Right? They, uh, we have two young kids at home, and whenever we feed them or we interact with them, there's a lot of give and take. You know, eat your broccoli, you know, finish your food. And I want a robot to be able to participate in such a dialogue, not just be a physical thing that you use or something that tells you what to do, but something that actually understands you and works along with you to solve really, really hard problems. So here's actually an example of some of our work. This is actually shared autonomy using a brain-computer interface. So we used a BCI system where we had um, electrodes implanted into our patient Jan's skull. Uh, we were using machine learning algorithms to decode her motor neurons. So motor neurons were firing. We were decoding those motor neurons. And we were using those decoded values to actually run uh, a control algorithm, a shared autonomy control algorithm on a robot to actually do what she was thinking of doing. So she was thinking about picking up that block and the robot was acting such that it would decode her motor, motor neurons and actually act accordingly. Uh, and this is, this is really exciting because what we want to build are interfaces where we can just seamlessly interact with them just like we would with our own limbs. And we work with prosthetic devices that can do this too. And the key here is that there's several interesting things here. One of them is that there is this constant feedback between what she thinks the robot is doing and what the robot is actually doing, so there's positive feedback. And secondly, most importantly, instead of turning our action, her thoughts into motor, raw motor commands for the robot, what we're doing is actually turning her thoughts into trying to build predictive models of what her intentions might be. So we're trying to decode what she wants to do eventually with the robot rather than what she wants to do immediately with that arm. And that switch in our, in our reasoning has actually enabled us to solve a lot of these problems. So I have a funny story about this. Um, the first time uh, you know, we, we had this running successfully, uh, we wanted to do a big press release, of course. And, um, and so we wanted our, our patient, Jan, uh, to be able to eat um, a chocolate bar. You know, that's something that she'd never been able to do after her injury. And so we started this system. We had this chocolate bar. It was working really well with blocks. And we saw, we noticed this very interesting thing happening, which was that she would grab hold of the chocolate bar, again, using you know, the, the brain control interface, and bring it close to her mouth. And then the arm would start oscillating wildly. You know, the arm just started oscillating wildly. Uh, so we tuned the gains. We, like, figured, we tried to do all this stuff. And we just couldn't figure it out. We just couldn't. Um, and, and this is quite a shock to us because it had been working really, really stably. And so after several hours, you know, we asked her, like, okay, what's up? <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> um, and she said that, and, and we sort of figured this out later on, that as soon as the chocolate bar started coming close to her mouth, she stopped thinking about bringing it closer to her mouth and started thinking about how delicious it would taste, <laughs> right? And that just completely threw off our algorithm. Our algorithm was just like, I don't know what's going on, right? 
Uh, and so, yes, we've come a long way, but I also want to say that, you know, the human mind is, is amazing and, and, and incredibly challenging. And, and we, we still just touch the surface of what we can do with these interfaces, right? Our algorithm was unable to deal with her sort of whimsical thoughts of the, the taste of the chocolate bar. And it was like, what is she trying to do now? I don't, I don't know. So it was, uh, it was actually quite an interesting experience for us. So we have a long way to go. Um, I want to talk about one other application that we've been looking at uh, quite a bit, uh, which is feeding. Um, this again came from talking to our users uh, about what they would want. Um, and the number one thing that our users said they wanted was they wanted a robot to be able to, they wanted to be able to feed themselves, right? They wanted a robot that could twirl spaghetti, cut chicken, you know, um, pick up a grape, pick up sushi. And, and so we said, okay, we'll, we'll do it. You know, I think that knowing that our users, our, our, our patients want this means that we, we must do it. And so we started a big initiative on it, and several of my students are here who are working on this. This is something I started almost six years ago uh, for manipulating deformable objects like food. How do we actually think about the science of manipulating deformable objects? What does it mean for a robot to automatically understand how to cut chicken? <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly complicated process of force control as well as perception. How do we know what's on a plate? That's actually a hard perception problem even now, right? You know, your, your Google image search can recognize a, a bird, a, a cat, uh, but it's very, very hard to recognize what's on a plate. So we, we've, been, we've been working really, really hard with Kinova on this. And, and this is actually one of our first videos that we shot. I don't know if you've been noticing, but um, this robot has been feeding my, this is my PhD student, Laura. She was a few months pregnant when this video was shot. Uh, uh, we had a small, I wouldn't say bug, but a preference in the algorithm where all it wanted to do was to feed her broccoli. You notice that it's not picking up the chicken at all. So she's literally eaten about like 50 broccoli by the time this video was shot. And she's like super sick about it. But, uh, you know, it just liked to detect and feed her broccoli. So. Um, I think that's also, again, coming back, it's an interesting problem, right, which is um, when, you, when you eat or when you feed somebody, again, there's all these choices that you're making subliminally about what to feed, how to feed, what do you feed after broccoli? Is it the chicken or do you feed more broccoli? Um, how do you, do you mix two things together? And when you mix two foods together, it becomes a new food. I mean, that's just mind blowing for a computer vision algorithm, right? <laughs> Uh, and, and all of this is incredibly, incredibly complicated and things that we're trying to address. So um, the first thing that we did was build uh, what we call an eye-enhanced system. We, uh, we, we built an eye for a robot in its hand. This is what the eye-enhanced system looks like. So we, we took the robot arm that we had built for Kinova and we put a camera right in its hand so that it could see what it was doing. And what we want to be able to do, and that's my postdoc Tapo who's actually in the audience here, uh, is to be able to use this eye in hand system uh, to do everything. Perceive the food, be able to manipulate the food, be able to cut the chicken, be able to feed somebody, be able to recognize their face, be able to understand their speech, all of it, right? I wanted everything to be completely self-contained in this arm. You just take this arm, you bolt it onto your wheelchair, go, right? Uh, and so the first thing we did was actually build hardware. One of the things that you realize uh, as a roboticist is that you have to be fearless about dealing with algorithms, software, but also build, build your own hardware. The second thing that we built was actually a bite detector. Um, how do we know what a good bite is? Uh, it's actually a really, really interesting and complicated problem. So we built a supervised learning algorithm. This is actually our, our neural network architecture. One of the interesting things here is not this architecture, but really what helped us a lot was identifying what that plate contained. Um, turns out the way you manipulate various foods, like, you know, whether it's a bell pepper or whether it's egg or whether it's something else that's red, the force with which you act upon it is very, very contextual. Like you, you act on it differently based on what you think it is. If you think it's squishy, then you're gonna act on it gently. If you think it's hard, like bell pepper, then you're gonna just go ahead and stab it. And so just its appearance, that it looks red, is insufficient for you to decide the force profile with which you would act upon it. Like the food, the way we manipulate food is incredibly contextual, right? 
And so really one of the ways we had to get our learning algorithm to, to understand how to manipulate food was to give it this sort of contextual information. So this is actually our algorithm that's saying that, oh, with 0.87 probability, I know that's bell pepper. That's actually a pretty decent guess, I'd say. Uh, and we were training this algorithm on just real data. So we were training it on data that we get. And one of the nice things is that as the system sees more and more bell pepper and food, it gets better at doing what it's doing. This is still an open and challenging problem. What happens when you mix two food items together? What is this learning algorithm going to predict? We don't know. But at least it's a step towards semantic understanding of the food that's on your plate. Right? And we all know that we try to look at the food that's on our plate, figure out what it is, and figure out what we want to eat. The force profile is another thing that was really, really interesting for us. So how, how do you understand how much force to exert onto food as you're picking it up? Like, do you just go ahead and stab every piece of food? Then you could destroy it. You could dismantle it, right? And so we built the world's most expensive fork to solve this problem just once. So this is a $4,000 fork. Uh, we, took a, we took a regular fork. As you can see, it says Ada only. Ada is the name of our robot. Um, and we cut the fork in half and stuck a six-axis force torque sensor in between. So this gives us a very, very, very high frequency and very, very high resolution, the forces and torques that are being exerted at the, at the tip of the fork. Right? And what we wanted to do was to understand the forces that people use when they manipulate objects, when they manipulate food. That's really important because we wanted to be able to learn from humans. You know, if you can learn the force signature with which you are able to twirl spaghetti, then maybe we can train a robot to be able to twirl spaghetti as elegantly and effortlessly. So we wanted to use this as training data to be able to learn how to manipulate objects. And here's some of the, the, the sort of the training data that we have. So this is, we, we have um, several hours of user studies where we asked our users to feed a mannequin. This is another interesting point is that the way you pick up food to eat yourself is very, very different from the way you pick up food to feed somebody. And so you can see how as you wiggle the food, you're able to feel that force signature. We had a, a, a motion capture system that was capturing the, the, the movement of the fork as the user was moving it. And what we want to do here is to be able to even detect mistakes. So you notice here that the user actually made a mistake in picking up the banana. This is the other fascinating thing. If you take high-speed video of, of eating and you're picking up food, you're just fumbling every single time. You're making hundreds of mistakes as you pick up your food. You're just correcting so quickly. But what we wanted to be able to do was to understand these force signatures and be able to transfer them to a robot such that the robot could learn how to, how to feed somebody through this. I want to talk about one other interesting piece, which is social dining. Um, until now, again, I've talked about how you feed somebody in isolation. But really, what I want to be able to do is to have a robot that can actually eat and feed somebody in a group. right? And when you're eating with a bunch of people, the dynamics of your speech, the cadence which is you're talking to each other, you're looking at each other, is, is hugely influential in how you eat. right? Uh, after we ran this study, a really, really easy way to make someone not eat is to look at them as soon as they start taking the, the bite of food to their mouth, they'll just stop eating. They'll just put it back down. Because as humans, we just don't want to see, be seen as you know, stuffing our face with our food. And, and I want a robot to be able to understand the social dynamics. Right? I want my robot to be able to understand that when somebody is looking at you, you should probably not be eating. And this is, again, an incredible complex social dance. So we ran another very, very large user study where we just got a bunch of people to just eat together. And we had cameras that, was tra that were tracking their faces. We were doing sound source localization, speech recognition. We are tracking their entire faces to try and understand a hidden Markov model to, to figure out how the cadence of social dynamics of feeding. Like, can we predict when you will take a bite based on just the dynamics of the conversation that you're having, such that the robot can actually feed you while being, while being completely understanding of the social dynamics? So that's, that's sort of the, um, the, you know, the challenges of being able to solve these problems. It's not just about working in isolation. It's about understanding how people eat. It's about understanding the force signatures. It's about understanding how people eat with each other. It's an incredibly complicated problem, but we're really excited to have taken some steps around it. So that's, that's uh, I want to sort of wrap up with, with a few thoughts. Um, I've given you sort of a, a, an overview of manipulation. 
Um, I still haven't answered my grandmother's question of why it's hard. I don't know the answer to that, but at least we're, we're trying, uh, and we continue to try. And what's really, really important is to understand manipulation with and around people. Right? Um, Michael, in his, uh, in his earlier statement, mentioned Rosie the Robot. Uh, Rosie the Robot was a, has been a great inspiration for many of us. Right? Uh, the ability to have an autonomous system that can perform complex manipulation tasks. But something we forget sometimes is that the main role that Rosie had in the Jetsons was as a caregiver, to actually care for people. And I think in the glitz and glamour of producing a robot that can like, do all kinds of physical manipulation tasks, we forget what its original role was, was to actually build rob was to, was to actually care for people. And that's something that I want to continue to emphasize, particularly to the next generation. But we need to always think about the applications of our work, the social good that can come out of it. I want to wrap up with sort of this has been my quest all along, is to really reconcile what robots are really good at, working in, in beautiful, perfect worlds, with what they ought to be good at, which is dealing with the nitty gritty of, of physical manipulation. And hopefully you've, you've learned a little bit about, uh, about manipulation and how exciting it is. I want to finally say that it's, it's a great honor to be, to be working uh, on robots with kids. Um, robotics is just a fantastic opportunity to talk about STEM, uh, I tell these kids, we, we host a lot of uh, kids, we host a lot of students, we tell them the math that you're learning today is what goes into these robots. It's what goes into the rockets that we build. And it's really, these are the, this is the generation that's going to solve all the really, really hard problems for us. Uh, and we get incredibly adorable letters from them um, all the time about how they love our robot. Um, and I want to acknowledge uh, my team. Uh, I'm merely a vehicle of their awesome work, and, uh, and it's been a great honor working with them. Thank you.